When clearing the house when my aunt died, we came across quite a lot of photographs. I would often sit on his knee, I liked sitting on his knee, and because uh, he was always telling stories, and then he would mention uh, things like trench foot and about the rats in the trenches, uh, but he, he didn't elaborate on anything because we were just children. You often talked about his experience during the First World War. There was a bit of sadness about him. When he died, his wife, who was expecting her fourth baby, um, went blind with the shock of the news. And a few years later, she, she was forced to put two of her girls into a workhouse. During the time when he was on that leave, the Middlesex Regiment went over the top and were wiped out. Hence, if he had been with them, I would not be here to this day. My father was in the First World War and um, I used to sit on his knee and uh, he'd say things but at that time I was young and I didn't understand, but now we're commemorating the uh, and, uh, centenary of the First World War and uh, I feel it's uh, important to know more about it and it makes it uh, as if he's got a voice, which I think they should have a voice. Uh, in the group photograph, this is me, uh, my sister Sylvia, a little bit older than me, my mother and this is my dad. I would often sit on his knee, I liked sitting on his knee, and because uh, he was always telling stories, and then he would mention uh, things like trench foot and about the rats in the trenches, uh, but he, he didn't elaborate on anything because we were just children. And, uh, but he did mention uh, names like Ypres, uh, Passchendaele and the Somme, but I didn't realise that he was actually, you know, I didn't even know there was a French language at that time. Uh, he, he, you know, I didn't realise that he was actually speaking the right, correct words because um, he was from Barbados and he had a little dialect which I was often trying to correct to get him to speak English so I didn't realise he was actually saying these French or Belgian places at all and uh, it's only lately, well not lately but uh, as you get older and you see that, yes, he, he was saying, you know what I mean. It's, it's like a lot of things when uh, people don't believe what old people say. This little picture is of my dad in uniform, and we think he was in the Sherwood Foresters. Somebody tried to lo uh, look at his cap and uh, emblem, and probably thinks it's in the Sherwood Foresters. And it was given to me by Grace, this is Grace here, his daughter, and uh, we visited a lot, she looked after us. And when I was leaving her, I think she would thought we would, wouldn't meet again. She produced this at the doorstep and uh, said this was found in her mother's purse when her mother died. That was with my father's first partner and she gave it to me and that's how I came to have it. And uh, I think it, it's uh, nice because obviously she loved him. I'm going to be talking about my uh, my great grandfather and my great uncle uh, George and William, and um, you know they were 15 and 16 when they signed up to the army. I just I can't imagine um, me signing up at that age. William and George they both signed up uh, at Leyton for the army, and um, William was put into the the Essex Territorial Regiment uh, as a Homeland Security. He was then shortly transferred to the Warwickshire's Royal Regiment and uh, he's, he survived three years of war and then died when he was 19 years old uh, in Passchendaele in Belgium. Um, even his certificate, his death certificate said that he died when he was 21 but he was only 19 when he died. George was just uh, 15 when he was assigned to the, the Royal Norfolk Regiment and uh, he was posted for some time in Egypt 
and then he was transferred to the, the Royal Welsh Regiment and he was um, sent off to France but they were, they were captured and um, somehow he, he escaped and he was on the run for, for roughly three weeks but uh, bear in mind George was just 16 at this time and he was hungry, he, was, he didn't know the language he didn't know where he was going so um, eventually he decided to go to a train station which was nearby and he saw a couple of guards and a line of people and uh, he naturally just joined the, the back of the end of the line and um, <laughs> basically uh, he joined the line of prisoners and the funny thing is that the, the, the German officers they couldn't understand why they had too many people uh, too many prisoners so um, yeah fortunately George survived the war and then he was a bus conductor for 44 years I uh, um, went as a co-driver on my first rally in 1952 and uh, uh, we were on the Bapome uh, uh, Albert Road which is the main road across the Somme and uh, s some friends were on a, in another car and uh, they had had a puncture so we stopped uh, we lent them the jack there was a cemetery opposite side of the road there is a uh, uh, stepped entrance uh, the, they had built a uh, sort of a, a, a pillar box and in that uh, was the uh, history of all the people who were killed and buried on that set in that cemetery and uh, I just out of interest I looked out of uh, uh, under my uh, um, um, mother's maiden name and there <coughs> coincidence the uh, um, second lieutenant Mo Moses Cohen, uh, 1st Surrey Rifles, was in it. I went home, obviously, after the rally, and uh, I asked my m mother about uh, uh, the details of uh, um, her eldest brother, and uh, her first comment was, well, why didn't you go and see my other brother? I said, I didn't know you hadn't. <laughs> anybody else in in the war. I then became really interested. I thought, well, I must go uh, uh, and see their graves um, and paid my respects, placed the stone on the top of a, uh, the grave so that it, I had visited it. And uh, um, it's strange, but uh, this habit of uh, Judaism um, marking the respect of all uh, headstones seemed to have caught on uh, with the younger generation and they uh, when I next went to the uh, uh, cemetery uh, they were piled with stones on top of the headstones. The first brother I saw when I went to uh, Walling Course or O Court um, he uh, was a second lieutenant, uh, he volunteered in 1915 and uh, went to France uh, I think in March uh, uh, 15 and uh, served on the Somme and was killed uh, uh, what, uh, 15th of September 1916, uh, uh, which happened to be my birthday. Another coincidence. 
The second uh, brother was a private. Uh, he was 19 years old. He was in the uh, Queen's Westminster Rifles and uh, he uh, um, was killed uh, within three months of uh, uh, landing in France. My mother uh, um, never mentioned uh, that to me, uh, but she did go over in 1927. I was, uh, uh, oh, she was pregnant uh, with me, uh, so I had a good founding uh, on the <laughs> battlefields. Uh, she broke down in tears uh, when she saw th the headstones uh, and she never went back. Uh, she, wouldn't, she couldn't bear it. Uh, it was too deeply uh, uh, enshrined. I remember as a child that there was this book on the bookshelves at home called With the Tenth Essex in France, which is a regimental history from the First World War. At the time it didn't really mean much to me, um, but later on I, I found that we had a number of photographs and various other things, including a load of letters that my um, one of my uncles had written to his mother at the time. Um, on reading these letters, they're, they're very personal um, and they reveal quite a lot about him without ever revealing how awful it must have been being out there. And um, I just felt that comparing myself to him at the, the age he was, he, I mean he died when he was 20 and I was thinking when I was 20 I was at university and running around and going to see bands and drinking and going to see The Clash and um, it's nice to be able to give my uncle a, a voice for himself um, to, to you know, bring him alive to people today. What I have here is a photo of my, my father's eld, two eldest brothers, Guy and Rex. Guy is on the left as you're looking at it, Rex on the right. Uh, and probably when they were about 11, I, I would imagine. Um, and it was taken, in, you know, a professional photo taken in a studio. Um, the, weird, the thing I find most remarkable is how much Rex, I think, looks like my middle brother, um, so carrying down through the family. The, at the bottom, and this is, I find this really quite poignant, is the original envelope and the telegram that my grandmother received to inform her that her son had died, which was presumably not very long after the first one had died. And I can imagine that when she saw the postman walking down the, down the drive that day, I can't imagine what she would have felt like, to be honest. You know, that would have been two, her two eldest sons within a week or so of each other. My father was born in 1911, so he would have been a, a young child when, when the First World War broke out. But his two eldest brothers, Guy, the eldest one, and Rex, the second oldest one, joined up almost as soon as the war had started in 1914. And they both survived right through till 1917. We don't know much about Guy, I'm sure the material's out there somewhere, but I know Rex survived the whole of Gallipoli. I know he was in North Africa before, before he went to France and then to Belgium. And um, one day um, he discovered that his elder brother, Guy, was in the vicinity, his, his regiment was in the vicinity, so he went over to try and visit him, only to discover that he'd been killed only a couple of days earlier. Um, this must have affected him incredibly badly, and you know, I mean, I'm trying to remember back to when I was 20, and if I found out about how my, you know, my my big brother had died, how I would have felt, um, and all this in the backdrop of um, you know, mud, guns, explosions, all the terrible things we know happened in the First World War. Anyway, for for whatever reason, and probably it was, it was for revenge. Rex was um, due to be part of an attack on. Um, on, on a German pillbox and uh, the uh, bombardment went ahead as planned. This was very early in the morning, about four o'clock in the morning. And, um, but for whatever reason, um, they got the order through to cancel the attack. And um, my uncle called for some uh, volunteers and went ahead with it anyway. And, and he and his sergeant and all the other men, apart from one, all, were all killed. And it's hard to kind of 
work out what his motivations might have been, but surely um, revenge must have been one of them. And um, that's quite, it's quite interesting thinking of the, of the morals of today, whether he would have been considered a hero or, or, a, or a fool, really, you know, for disobeying orders and taking his men with him. When clearing their house when my aunt died, we came across quite a lot of photographs. And this one was one of her brother, my uncle Sam. And I th thought it was important to tell the story because it was rather a, a sad one. This is my uncle's wedding photograph. And his wife was well known to my to the family because she visited them quite a bit. What I do know about them is that they'd been sweethearts for a long time, even as far back as school days. But um, he came on leave to be married, but tragically, just after he went back, she died of that awful epidemic, the Spanish flu and it had a devastating effect upon him. He never remarried, but he always seemed to be, there was a bit of sadness about him. Although I didn't have a lot of contact with him, I did see him from time to time. And this is a photograph towards the end of his life, when he was very fond of, as you can see, a budgerigard. And um, I did visit him, and um, he was always very, very kind. My father joined the Royal Flying Corps in 1917, and he became a wireless operator. He used to fly in aeroplanes called the RE-8 where the pilot was sitting in the front and the wireless operator behind him sending out more scoped messages. When 1947, when the Cold War was on, I joined the Royal Air Force and I became a wireless operator. And when I came back from Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, where I was stationed, we used to have a lot of jokes and fun together. He would spell my name and I would spell his name in Morse code. My father's name in Morse code is Da Da, Da Da Da, Di Di Di, Da Di Da Da. And my name in Morse code is Di 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 Da Da Di Da Di 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 Da Di Da Di Da Da. I would say to him, I love you, and he would say to me, be a good boy in Morse code. Wonderful memories of those little messages that we passed to one another. My father was 16 years old when the First World War broke out. He went to join up, but unfortunately he was too young. But in 1917, when he was just 18, he joined up and he joined the Royal Flying Corps. Did his training to become a wireless operator, and then he boarded a boat from Marseille and when they arrived in the Mediterranean, the boat was hit by a torpedo. The name of the ship was the SS Aragon. Over 600 people lost their lives on the boat. There were 200 nurses on board and they managed to make to the lifeboats where they were rescued. Loads of soldiers went down with the ship, but my father, he held on to a raft. Some of the other soldiers swam to a ship nearby which unfortunately was also sunk. They were then picked up, the ones who survived, and they were taken to Jaffa in Israel. When they arrived there, through all the heat, they were parched. So they went to all the orange trees, pulled the oranges off the tree, 
and it bit into them without peeling them and they went down with dysentery. They went, went to a camp where they survived obviously and they stayed there for two or three weeks before joining their battalion. They also managed to have some leave and my father went in on, went amongst the pyramids where he got on a camel and went for a camel ride. This is a prized photograph, if not one of my most treasured, if not the most treasured photograph that I have in my possession. This is my dad that I'm pointing to. He was the oldest of seven brothers who were all born in Forest Gate in East Ham. My father, when he joined up into the Royal Flying Corps, he was sent to Israel. And being a Jew, it's the most amazing thing that he should wind up in Israel. He went to the Wailing Wall there, and when he came back after he did his service, he never ever went abroad again. The story that my mum told me one day, one day when she come home from the from the pub and she was discussing it with my dad. And then afterwards, I asked my mum, "What was the what was the story about?" And she told me that she was in the pub drinking with dad, as usual on a Sunday. And there were three men discussing the, the unknown soldier. And one of them mentioned there's no such person. And that's when Mum turned, turned on him and told him the full story of, of Dad's participation in the uh, finding and the recovery of an unidentified body. While Dad was re recovering bodies, the sergeant received a message tell telling them that if they find if they find an unknown, unidentified body, they is to report it to headquarters. At the last date, they found this body, and the sergeant reported it. He was told then to. Um, Escorted it back to uh, the to, to the base, and which he had done. And when he got back with the body, they placed it in a chapel. And from then on, uh, in in line with other bodies, a high-ranking officer came in in the hall, and he walked along the rows of body. And um, and then he signalled or put his hand down, and which he chose one. And this this high-ranking officer was um, had a mask, so he could not be identified. The body was then chosen, and he he uh, walked silently out the room, and they removed the rest of the bodies, which was about five. And that one, the, the body remaining that was um, then transported to back to England and along to um, Westminster Abbey, where it was now known as the Unknown Warrior.
This is my grandmother, Nancy Garnett, in the uniform she wore as a young nurse in the Red Cross Hospital in Buxton, Derbyshire, from 1914 to 1918. When I was a teenager, she talked to me often about war and how intensely it affected her. Her stories are powerful memories for me, and I have inherited her scrapbooks, full of photos and cuttings, as well as drawings, poems and messages from the Belgian and British soldiers she cared for. I am Nancy. Working as a nurse opened a new world for me, and I became close to so many of the young soldiers who became our patients, one of whom wrote this poem in my scrapbook. I covet no man's wealth, no, no pride, pride of ancient birth. birth. Below, Below you'll, you'll find just what I want, while here, here upon this earth. earth. Send, Send me out, out to France again, I'm feeling, feeling pretty, pretty fit. fit. For, For a chance of getting, getting wounded, wounded, I'll, I'll do, do another, another bit. I promise not to swing it, I'll, I'll endeavour to be brave. brave. It, it gives, gives me one more earthly brave. of getting what I crave. For just one little blighty, with Miss Garnet as my nurse, you can keep your civvy suit chum. You can keep your big fat purse. Once more to get to Buxton. Once more to take the cure. To have Nurse Garnet tuck me in and take my temperature. To tell me yarns, brew me tea and put my dressing on. To give me quarts of milk and make me feel tray bon. And what a Buxton weather. It can snow for all I care. If I'm, if I'm there, there I get Nurse Garnet. With, with her, her no, no nurse, nurse can compare. compare. For all, for all the, cups the cups of tea, of tea I've had, she'll get the PPC. PPC. To, to Nurse, nurse Vickery, Vickery for helping, I'll award the DBE. I want another stint like this, I'll get it or I'll rave. Because I think I ought to have it, it's the only thing I crave. Dear Nurse Garnet, make allowances and please remember that we have not all had a college education. I write these few lines to post in your war book. May it stick for generations. It is certainly weak but it is written in the right spirit, written by one who respects you highly, is very grateful for all the kindness you have shown him, and recognises the fact that you have helped considerably to make his stay in Buxton VAD a happy one. J.B. Callaghan, Tank Corps, 18th of September, 1918. Well, I think this, you know, this, this should be told it is because my father and I, we didn't have a really close relationship. Uh, and when I was a youngster, it was um, little boy should be seen and not heard. And quite a few times it was, you know, go, go to the back of the class. But uh, later on in life, um, uh, I, I did know that he served in Egypt. But later on in life, when I got married, um, the, the, the girl I married, she came from Egypt. And um, that, that sort of uh, rustled up a few through uh, skeletons in the cover about me father. <laughs> he never used, never used to joke with me, except for um, when he knew that I was marrying a young lady from Egypt, um, that he said, oh, I could be your father. That's about one of the only times he did joke with me. I know that uh, my, my father and his two brothers joined the army at Holly Hedge House. Um, that's my father, Bert. That's his brother, Fred. That's his other brother, Walter. Um, Bert, Fred and Walter, Walter was the eldest. I know they joined uh, the army, but, uh, um, and in 1916, Dad transferred over to the, uh, to the Royal Air Force, just after uh, they, they became the Royal Air Force, it was the uh, Royal Flying Corps. And I know for a fact that he served in Egypt. And there's not a, not a lot of um, the brothers went to war, the 1480 war, all came back, all, all three brothers came back. I know that um, when Dad uh, transferred over to the RAF, um, it was just just after it was the um, Royal Flying Corps, and uh, three. I, I do know part of his RAF records, and he was a rigger. Um, and uh, the only the only things I have from Dad are these two artifacts that I hold in my hand, plus his service medals. But um, I do have a few photographs of when he was in Egypt and um, standing by a biplane and another uh, a photograph is um, a bad day for me a, a plane had crashed but not not very badly uh, i don't think anybody was killed but um, 
this this piece here, um, that that the, 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 that's the tip of the, the uh, propeller, and that would have been carved. The RAF sign on the front would have been carved by a penknife, uh, and the same as this this one here. Um, as you can see, it was a box. I think he might have been a jewellery box for when he came home for, for one of his sisters, had eight sisters. Um, and uh, it's the only bits and pieces I have from Dad. My grandma was just a small child when her father died in the First World War, and it had quite a lasting impact obviously on her life and the lives of her sisters so that was passed down to me because I knew my grandma until she died in her 90s not so many years ago so it was quite a, um, a, a big impact of the First World War on the, on the family. This is my great-grandfather George Ralph uh, he was with the horse transport convoy with the Army Service Corps and he died when he was 40 in, of polio in France and he was buried in a military cemetery. Um, at, apparently when he died his wife who was expecting her fourth baby um, went blind with the shock of the news and a few years later she, she was forced to put two of her girls into a workhouse because she couldn't look after them anymore. My grandma was um, two and a half when her father died and uh, she had an, an older sister and then two younger sisters. One was only one and a half when her father died and the other one hadn't been born, she was born two months later. Um, their mother wasn't able to look after all four of them so a few years later they went, when my grandma was five, they went to, she and her younger sister went into a workhouse and uh, there she was Put to work in a mill when she was eight years old so she worked in the mill in the morning and then was schooled in the afternoon so that had quite an impact on her life really um, she always wanted to visit her father's grave and she did that when she was 81 after her husband had died my grandfather because he didn't really want to have anything to do with war having fought in the second world war himself so I think it was good that she went and she was pleased to have seen her father's grave in France. Um, yeah. The reason I'm telling this story is that my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, and his brother, my great uncle, were at the Battle of the Somme in June and July 1916. I'm going to read from the diary of bombardier Sidney Alfred Samuel, my great uncle. Friday the 30th of June 1916. Night and day we have an hour's sleep whenever possible to spare one man. Friday night is getting exciting. The infantry are going to the trenches in hundreds, all smiling and cheerful. Friday night is quite, not quite so busy. July the 1st. But still a heavy rate of fire. 7.30 a.m. The boys go over the top and we batter the Germans for all that we are worth, lifting our fire as the boys go forward. We can tell they are advancing because our rangers increase increasing by 100 yards at a time. The boys have done well at 9.30 a.m. on Saturday. The wounded are coming back in batches, but all are smiling. About every 10 minutes, a batch of Hun prisoners come along looking absolutely dumb up. Saturday afternoon at 4.30, we, ordered to, we are ordered to advance. So we go forward and take up a position in the open, throwing up a few sandbags for colour. The Germans make a counter-attack on Sunday night, but are driven back by our infantry and artillery fire. We keep up a steady rate of fire night and day for a week. The Huns are making counter-attacks almost every night, but are always driven back. I went and saw the battlefield a few hours after the charge. It was an awful sight. Many of our boys had fallen, but there were three times as many Germans. 
The ground was simply covered with dead. We are not rest camp now, having left our guns to be overhauled, but I would far sooner be in action. The boys must be doing well, for I have seen guns and material and batches of prisoners coming down the road every day. By the way, our gunner's position was shelled the same night that we left. If we'd been there, well, someone would have gone west, but luck was with us right through that exciting and terrible three weeks. No doubt the rest is doing our fellows a lot of good. We'll stop now. There's nothing exciting ha happens in a rest camp that is miles from anywhere. At that point, the diary finishes. Seven days later, Sidney Samwell was killed in action. The sequel to the story is that following the death of my great uncle, my grandfather was granted compassionate leave from the Middlesex Regiment and returned to the UK. During the time while he was on that leave, the Middlesex Regiment went over the top and were wiped out. Hence, if he had been with them, I would not be here to this day. My father used to enjoy taking his children for a walk, particularly on weekends. And during this walk, he often talked about his experience during the First World War. And in fact, what happened to him in 1908, before the First World War commenced, uh, he went, was called up in the army and did his service. So when it came to 1914, the beginning of the First World War, he was immediately called up because he already had military training. And he was not in a fighting regiment, but he was supplying the army with goods and maybe food, it may be we weapons, but he often told me the story about the horse of his cart stepping on his foot and he didn't like that a bit. But He's managed to survive the First World War without injuries, while co contrarily his twin brother, who was an officer in the army, had uh, an injury to his arm. And then in 19... 33, when Hitler came to power, my father tried and did obtain letters from the government to prove that he had served in the First World War and also got the Iron Cross for his service to the Kaiser. He thought that he was safe from Nazi persecution, but when it came to November 1938, he, like other Jewish men aged 16 and older, was put into the local jail and transported from there with thousands of others to one of the concentration camps. He was sent to Buchenwald. This was in November. Fortunately, my mother managed to get a visa for my father, for, for my parents to get to England. And that my father had to sign a document that he would leave Germany by a certain date. 
and in fact he was released from Buchenwald in December 1938. He had spent many weeks in hospitals because he had had breakdowns as a result of his experience in Buchenwald. When he came to England in August 1939, just before Hitler invaded Poland, he had to travel with a male nurse and he had periodic breakdowns in England, but he never hesitated to work and one of the work, type of work that helped him to recover his health was to work as a jobbing gardener in Banbury, very near Sipford Gower, where my sisters were in a Quaker school, in attending a Quaker school. So my father went by bus, Mr. Tucker had a bus from Sipford to Banbury and during my holidays when I came from Cornwall to visit my parents in Sipford, I went with him by bus and helped him weeding the gardens. I'd like to talk about my father, who was coerced into action in the First World War by the jingoistic attitude of many people. He was a good, kind man, a very generous man, a very patient man, and a very loving man, and I think it's right that he should be remembered for what he truly was. They used to change the number of uh, regiments in the line to give them a rest. They would move one regiment back and bring another one forward, and the Germans did the same. One day, one of the Germans that were opposite my father shouted out, Hey Tommy, you're the Anglo-Saxons. We're the Saxons. We're nearly brothers. We won't shoot if you won't shoot. And they came to an understanding that they wouldn't shoot. And the Germans used to chalk their regiment number on a shovel and they used to put it up above the parapet. And as soon as the British soldiers saw that shovel with the number on it, they used to pass the word down the line and say, shovels up, shovels up. And that meant that the, the war would stop until the next lot came in. And one day my father was talking to one of these Saxons and he said, Tommy, we're moving out tomorrow, keep your head down because the Prussians are coming in and they will shoot at anything that moves. There was a strange incident involving my father towards the end of the war. His regiment had suffered a terrible defeat and they pulled back quite a way and they had to dig fresh uh, entrenchments and they put a barricade on a road which led straight towards the German lines. And after about two days, a couple of German soldiers came creeping down the road, obviously looking to see where the British were. And my father said, we can't just shoot them down in cold blood. So he shouted out to them, look out, Fritz. And the Fritz, the German, said, oh, thanks very much, Tommy. And they put their shoulders up, their rifles up on their shoulder, and they walked up to the barricade and started talking to my father. And they were chatting, and my father said, you speak very good English. And so this German said, well, I should do. Before the war, I was a waiter at the Savoy Hotel in London. And then, fortunately, out of the corner of his eye, my father saw an officer coming. So he said to these Germans, quick, Scarpa, get away, our officer's coming. And the officer came up and he wanted to put my father on a charge for fraternising with the enemy. But fortunately, my father's soldiers were good mates and they said, no, sir, we haven't seen any no, Germans here, sir, no. And, but if my... My father would have been shot if this officer had found a witness. When the war had ended, our family were in a very unusual situation inasmuch that they had four brothers, all of whom served in the war, and all four came home. My father, when he came home, he had to go to Crystal Palace for an official demobilisation parade. They were up at the old uh, Crystal Palace site and they were told that they had to parade there and they were all, all hundreds of them all waiting because they were going to have a talk and an official dismissal by a top general. 
after they'd been there a long time in the cold, they were told that the general was going to be delayed for about half an hour, and they didn't like that at all. My father happened to notice that, he, he was in the back row, of, incidentally, and he happened to notice that in the brick wall behind him was a little green door, so he carefully disengaged himself from the squad, tried the door and it opened, so he popped through the door and shut it and he jumped on a number 75 bus which ran to Lee Green and he came home on a 75 bus. So he never officially got dismissed. Technically he deserted. I think my father's feelings were handed down to me in one way because at the end of the Second World War I was in the army of occupation that went into Germany and I was expected to find all these terrible horrible people that we'd been told about. Actually I found they were quite nice people and more like us than anyone else and I made a lot of friends that have lasted now, friendships that have lasted for 60 years. There was one family in particular that befriended me and I used to somewhat unofficially go and spend weekends with them and they treated me just like a son. I used to call them Mutti and Papi, Mum and Dad, and they, we kept in contact with the family and they still write to me to this very day. Friendships lasted for 60 years and I found that people are the same wherever they are.